to which every American was to fall heir. Immediately what he was doing was calling us to look at the higher ideals of the country, even though our country was not living up to those highest ideals. But it's, the words are so powerful that are right there in the Declaration of Independence, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And so what a prophet really does, when a prophet is truly operating in his or her gift, is calling us to look at the higher truth, calling us to rise back up to our highest ideal, calling us to rise back up to the truth of ourselves. I'm also remembering, if we think about Dr. King, one of the famous quotes that he spoke on that day and spoke at the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955, until justice rose down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. He was paraphrasing the book of Amos, which is interesting because he was really positioning himself, aligning himself with the biblical prophets, but standing in a different way as a 20th century prophet. And the reason that I think it's interesting that, that in this moment as we're talking about astrotheology, as we're talking about moving from I believe to I know in this age of Aquarius, and then looking at this weekend, we're celebrating this momentous occasion when a prophet in our own midst called us, reminded us, invited us to look to the higher ideals, the higher truths, and to begin to live from that place. Well, it took me to an astrotheological text in the Bible, and that's the book of Revelation. Now, the book of Revelation, many would say, how in the world does that have anything to do with astrology? Doesn't it have to do with the end of the world? Doesn't it have to do with the rapture? No, it doesn't. The world will not end. Revelation is talking about the end of the age. And the best way to put or frame the context of the book of Revelation, it's really a dramatization of this movement of our galaxy, of our solar system, from Pisces to Aquarius. But the writer of this text personifies all of these characters, and it's a great drama, it's amazing, it's wonderful, and you have the seven seals and the scrolls, and all of these crazy things are happening. But when we begin to look at it, you'll see very clearly that it's an astrological text. Now, just a little background on the book of Revelation. Um, you know, many times people will say revelations. There's only one revelation in the book. So it's the book of Revelation, but actually the name of the book would be the Revelation of John or the Apocalypse of John. And so we have that word, oh no, it's the Apocalypse, the end of the world. Well, the word Apocalypse, I just want to clarify what that word means. Again, it, our English word Apocalypse comes from a Greek word, Apocalypsis. And what Apocalypsis means is laying bare making naked a disclosure of truth, instruction concerning things before unknown, and unveiling, uncovering, revealing, revelation. And so the book is the revelation of John. So when we hear the word apocalypse, that doesn't mean end of the world, it means a revelation. So if you want to ever use that word, use it in that sense. I'm uncovering something. The revelation of Greg, the apocalypse of Greg. <laughs> You're uncovering something, and, and, and that's, that's it's, it's, you know, a beautiful word and a wonderful word, but this is what the writer of Revelation was doing, and it's interesting also that it's the apocalypse of John. As we talked about last week, the book of John, as we look at the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, represent the seasons and represent uh, different astro astrological uh, houses. The book of John is the Aquarius book. So... It only seems fitting that John, the disciple that represents the sign of Aquarius, would also be the writer of the book that is dramatizing this move from Pisces to Aquarius. And so I just want to uh, pinpoint one, one little area here to just talk about the symbolism. Um, there, there's, there's so much symbolism in this book. You, the, the number seven is heavily prevalent. Um, you have the seven churches and the seven seals. The number four is heavily prevalent, the, the four cherubim, the, the four horsemen. And I want to look at this, this one verse quickly, just to, to give you an example of something. In Revelation 4, verses 2 through 8, uh, this is the writer uh, in the voice of John speaking. And the writer says, And once I was in the Spirit, and there in heaven stood a throne, with one seated on the throne, and one seated there looks like jasper and carnelian. Around the throne is a rainbow that looks like an emerald. Around the throne are 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones are 24 elders dressed in white robes with golden crowns on their heads. 
coming from the throne are flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and in front of the throne burning seven flaming torches, which are the seven spirits of God. And in front of the throne there is something like a sea of glass, like crystal. Around the throne and on each side of the throne are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second creature like an ox, the third creature with a face like a human face, and the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and inside. Day and night without ceasing they sing, Holy, 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 the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is to come. Now right here in this verse, in this chapter, really crystallizes this whole idea that this book is dramatizing moving from Pisces to Aquarius. One of the things, if you study the movement of the stars and the movement of our, our solar system into this new age, you will know that we're moving into fixed signs. We're moving into the place where our fixed signs are Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius, which is a beautiful thing from an astrological standpoint because it really crystallizes um, sort of the energy as, as we're thinking about an ascended age or an enlightened age. It's crystallizing that energy. Well, here in the text it says, the first living creature was like a lion, Leo. And then it goes on to say, and the second creature was like an ox, Taurus. And the third living creature with a face like a human face, Aquarius. As we talked about last week, the sign of Aquarius is a water bearer. It's a man holding a pitcher of water, like a human face. And then we have the creature flying like an eagle, that's Scorpio. If you look into uh, the ancient symbolism of Scorpio, the symbol for Scorpio wasn't always a scorpion. It was, it was an eagle. Similarly, with the sign of cancer, the crab wasn't always the sign of cancer, the, the scarab. Um, if you go back to the Egyptian um, folklore and, and look at, at Egyptian astrology and understanding, the scarab beetle was the symbol for uh, cancer, and there's a lot of reasons for that. So here we have dramatized, I mean, because that was interesting language, right? There you know, 24 elders and the jasper and the rainbow that looks like emeralds. It's a dramatization of what's happening in the heavens, and it's beautiful when we read it like that. But with all of that said, that's beautiful and wonderful, and you know, we can, I could literally just sit here for hours and just break down all of these scriptures, right? But that's not, to me, that's pointless. It goes back to what we talked about two weeks ago, that, that knowing is half the battle. Knowledge is cute, and I'll talk about it all the time. Information is wonderful. We, our libraries are full. We have plenty of books. We can study and Google these things. But what I'm interested in is how will this affect how we stand and live in the earth? And so that's where the title for this message came, because I remember that there's something in the book of Revelation that really speaks to what Dr. King was talking about 50 years ago, and where we are being invited to stand in as we have an understanding of what the age of Aquarius is about. And so in the book of Revelation, in chapter 21, verses 1 through 5, the writer says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, I am making all things new. This is the picture of the age of Aquarius. As we talk about Job recognizing in the age of Gemini that I can see God and live. As we talked about last week, the idea that the comforter comes not only dwells among us, but dwells within us. Here we are hearing, echoing those same words again, that the home of God is among mortals. There was the ancient idea, how could God be anywhere where we are? There was the ancient idea of believing in the fall, that there's something wrong with us, so there's no way that God could be where we are. But here in this new age, in this new understanding, we understand and recognize that God dwells within us and among us. And as we begin to recognize that, as we begin to stand in that, well, yes, pain shall be no more. Death shall be no more because our understanding of it has shifted. 
We recognize that we are eternal, infinite beings. We cannot die. Yes, this soul clothing may leave, but who you are can never be destroyed. This is the idea of the new heaven and the new earth. And as I began to hear that scripture in my mind and think about where we are being invited to stand, where we are moving into to have an experience of a new heaven and a new earth, it took me to one of my favorite people, Joseph Campbell, in The Power of Myth. He's having this conversation with Bill Moyers, and there. Bill Moyers is asking him, well, what, what are the new myths? What are the new ways that we must begin to see ourselves and see our world in order to move forward as humanity itself? And Campbell replies, he says, we need myths that will identify the individual, not with his local group, but with the planet. The only myth that is going to be worth thinking about in the immediate future is one that is talking about the planet, not the city. Not these people, but the planet and everybody on it. That's my main thought for the future of what the future myth is going to be. And what it will have to deal with is exactly what all myths have to do. <coughs> the maturation of the individual from dependency Daddy. through adulthood, through maturity, Daddy. and then to the exit. And then how to relate to this society and how this society relates to nature and the cosmos. That's what the myths have all talked about and what this one's got to talk about. But the society that it's got to talk about is the society of the planet. Bill Moyers then asks the question, he says, so you suggest that from this begins the new myth of our time? And Campbell goes on, yes. This is the ground of what the myth is to be. It's already here, the eye of reason. Not of my nationality, the eye of reason. Not of my religious community, the eye of reason. Not of my linguistic community. Do you see? And this would be the philosophy for the planet. Not for this group, that group, or the other group. When you see the earth from the moon, you don't see any divisions there of nations or states. This might be the symbol, really, for the new mythology to come. That is the country, the country that we're going to be celebrating. And those are the people that we are one with. So if you see on your seats, you have an image. Campbell says that when you see the earth from the moon, you don't see any divisions there of nations or states. I invite you to just, as I'm speaking, look at this image. Because what's interesting is that if we think about how humanity's understanding and idea of the earth has transitioned, we're being asked again to from this view of the earth, begin to live from a different place. And so there was a time that our ancestors, our foremothers and forefathers, believed that the earth was flat. And they lived life a certain way because of that. Some believed that the earth was square. Others believed that it was hollow because that was the only place that the underworld could be. But we evolved from that, and then we, many believed that the earth was the center of the universe, which is interesting. When we think about the ways in which humanity has tried to dominate the earth and dominate nature, if we're the center of the universe, of course, we can do anything. We can do all we want to do because we're the center. But then, and oh, there was also the idea that the sun revolved around the earth. Not even understanding that we were just part of one galaxy and a part of a solar system. A part of a larger conversation, if you will. And so this image that we have here, this image is called the blue marble. We have many images of the Earth, color images, as early as about 1965. But in 1972, this image came on the scene. And it was nicknamed the Blue Marble because the astronauts, when they went, went to space and went to the moon and the different Apollo missions, many of them, as they said, when you would look at the Earth from the point of the moon, it was like just a blue marble, just out there. And it was a name that sort of stuck. And what's interesting about this, when we look at that moon, I don't see that picture, that image. I don't see black people and white people. I don't see Asian or Native American, Latino. I don't see the United States and South America. I don't see Asia and Europe. It's all one. It's all one. That's our home. And so as we look at this idea from the book of Revelation of a new heaven and a new earth, and we begin to hear the ideas of Joseph Campbell as he's saying that what is necessary for our time is to recognize that we are one people on one planet. 
That no longer can we just identify as New Yorkers. No longer can we just identify as Americans. No longer can we just identify as black or Latino or, or white or Asian. No longer can we identify as, as rich or poor. Rich or poor is not in that picture. Do you see rich or poor in that picture? Do you see haves and have nots in that picture? This is the vision of the new heaven and the new earth. And I, I just want to share that there's two quotes, one from a, an astronaut, Frank Borman in 1968, he said this, he said, when you're finally up at the moon looking back on earth, all those differences in nationalistic traits are pretty well going to blend. And you're going to get a concept that maybe this really is one world. And why the hell can't we learn to live together like decent people? Mm. In 1994, Carl Sagan wrote something powerful. He says, look at that dot, as, as, as he's talking. Look at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you have heard of, every human being who ever was, who lived out their lives, the aggregate of our joy and suffering. Thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and every forager, Every hero and every coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and every peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, every hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species live there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. And so in order for this new idea to emerge, as our solar system is moving, whether we choose for it to move or not, in order for us to begin to embrace this idea and live from that idea and that ideal, the highest ideal here on the earth, in and as our lives, it requires two things. It requires willingness, and it requires courage. So what is willingness? To be willing is to be disposed or consenting, inclined, cheerfully consenting or ready, done, born, used with cheerful readiness. That's to be willing. And one thing I loved about when I was looking at the definition of willing, it, it, the word cheerful was there several times. That's interesting, right? Yeah. Because sometimes we, we say we're willing to do something, but it's regretful, right? Mm -hmm. Or with hesitation. That's not being willing. <coughs> when we're willing, we're excited, we're cheerful, we're happy. But then there's courage. Courage is the quality of mind or spirit that enables a person to face difficulty, danger, pain, etc., without fear and with bravery. And I thought it was interesting just to look at the synonyms as well for courage. Endurance. Fortitude, fearlessness, grit, adventurousness, nerve, determination, and boldness. But what courage is not is cowardice, meekness, timidity, weakness. There's a book that I love that I, that I just read recently, Power Versus Force by David Hawkins. And he presents an idea, uh, he, he presents an idea where we're able to measure the level of consciousness across the globe. And he says that for centuries, humanity remained at this level of 190. And in consciousness, that's not good. Okay? And what he posits in the book is that we must move to start from the level of 200 in order to move up. And the level of 200 is the level of courage. And what he says is that just in 1990, humanity collectively moved to 207, which is interesting to me as I think about this age that we're moving into. And many astrologers and astronomers would say that 1990 began the watershed moment where we really began to feel the energies of Aquarius in a profound way. When we look at the fact that the emergence of the internet really took place in the 90s. The internet existed, but in, in terms of mass emergence, in terms of the interconnectedness that we talk about as the example of Aquarius, that happened in the 90s. 
Our consciousness has shifted from that point till now because we understand that we're connected in a way that we could never understand before. The ways in which we can remotely and wirelessly connect to anyone in the world. I can post something on Facebook or anywhere on the internet and in interact with people, millions of people, instantly. That was just a thought in mind previously, but now it's a physical reality. And so as we understand that we collectively as humanity have moved into this place of courage, well now is your opportunity. Are you going to stand in willingness and courage in your life when the conversation is right in front of your face, right? We can, we can, we can look at this picture of the planet, it's beautiful and it's wonderful and, oh, we're one and, you know, all humanity. But how does that play out on the street? How are you living from that place, being fearless at your job when you see discrimination against one of our LGBT brothers and sisters? who is your brother and your sister. Are you able to stand in that idea of one family, one planet, one earth, in that moment? <clears throat> or how are you able to stand when there are other circumstances, when you see discrimination, when you see prejudice anywhere? As we hear the words of Dr. King again, injustice, anywhere. If you see it happening anywhere, are you willing to take that stand? Are you courageous enough to take that stand? Those moments when you're with your friends and little jokes pass by, are you able to be the one that says, that's not cool, that's not funny? Because you're talking about me when you're talking about that person. You're talking about yourself when you're talking about that person, when you're laughing about that person, when you're joking about that person. See, this is the only way that the new heaven and the new earth is going to come into being. It's a powerful idea. It's a powerful, powerful teaching. But it requires your participation. And so in this moment, I invite everyone to stand. As we close with a prayer, I'm remembering that when I was five years old, I wrote my first song. I got it. My first drum set for Christmas. And I sat at that drum set day in and day out. And I kept singing this line over and over again. Come to heaven with me. Come to heaven with me. Now what's interesting to me when I think about a little boy singing that, I imagine that maybe I was just in my bliss. I was in heaven. I was, a, I was playing this instrument and, and tapping into this thing that I came to earth with this gift and was just in heaven and bliss, but I also hear and feel and believe that there was something within me that understood that it was time for us as humanity to come together in a more profound way. And so here we have the voice of a child saying, come to heaven with me. Do you want to go to that place? It's not a place up in the sky. It's not a place that you go to after you die. It's a place that's here and now. I hear the words of Bob Marley. <laughs> Most people think great God will come from the sky, take away, get, take away everything. But if you know what life is worth, you will look for it here on earth. It is here that you will find heaven. Heaven is right where you're standing. It is here that you will find peace. Peace is right where you're standing. It is here that you will find bliss. And so, in this moment, I invite us all to go with it. Come to heaven with me. Because where I am standing here now is in a place of unconditional love. Where I am standing here now is in a place of unconditional joy. Where I am standing here now is a place where pain no longer exists. Where I am standing here now is where peace is the order of the day. And so we are choosing in this moment to recognize that as our solar system has moved into the new age, as our planet has moved into the new age, so we are choosing within ourselves to ascend, to rise up in consciousness to the level of courage and to the level of willingness, no longer allowing that which does not serve all 
to have a place. No longer allowing that which does not benefit all to have a say. But we are choosing to stand in this new awareness, in this new experience of life, this new experience of equality, this new experience of freedom that rings across our entire planet, not just in this United States. Yes, we hear the words of our brother, Dr. Martin Luther King, as he asked for freedom to ring all across the United States, but today we take that idea and we rise it up just a little bit higher. And we call for freedom to ring in the United Kingdom, and we call for freedom to ring on the continent of Africa, and we call for freedom to ring in South America, and we call for freedom to ring in Egypt, where our brothers and sisters are suffering, where there is killing happening daily, we call for freedom to ring. In China, we call for freedom to ring. In Russia, we call for freedom to ring on this beautiful blue and white planet that we call Earth. And not only that, we rise up even further and we say we call for freedom to ring in our galaxy. Because we understand that we are one of many. We call for freedom to ring beyond our galaxy. And we know that as this freedom rings and as we allow it to ring, as we allow it to ring globally, as we allow it to ring universally, as we allow it to ring individually, everything changes. And so God, I am grateful for the change. God, I am grateful for the shift. I am grateful for the ascension. I am grateful for these souls that are here and within the sound of my voice, as they are the vessels who have come to the scene at this moment, at the moment that the consciousness of the earth changed. Just as those long ago, as the earth changed from recognizing that it was flat, not, not flat, recognizing that it was not a square, recognizing that it was not hollow, recognizing that we were not the center of the universe. So now we are the ones that have chosen to be here in this time when we understand that we are one planet and one planet, <laughs> living one life connected to one source. And so this week we are choosing to stand in that in beautiful, powerful, and profound ways. I am grateful for the ways in which it will show up in our lives, and I am grateful and thankful for the ways in which it will continue to transform things in this country and beyond. Together we lift up our voices and we say, Amen. Amen. Ashe. Ashe. And so it is. So it is.